name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God, pray for, pray for us sinners, sinners now, now and at the hour of our death. Christ is risen. He indeed. Is risen indeed. In the name yeah. of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brethren in Christ, welcome to the Meaning of Catholic. I'm Timothy S. Flanders. Uh, the mission of Meaning of Catholic is uniting Catholics against the enemies of the Holy Church. Today we have some special guests. We're going to be talking about COVID-1984, the Ministry of Truth. If you don't know what I'm talking about, every breathing person in the 20th century, 21st century needs to read 1984 to understand what that's all about. Today we're welcome, welcome the Gordon brothers, Dave and Timothy. How y'all doing? Doing so, well. Yeah, thank you. How are you, Tim? Doing well. Glad you guys could be on the show. They just released a new book, Rules for Retrogades, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. We also have with us Paleocrat, Meaning of Catholic contributor. Yeah. Jeremiah, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good. And it was awesome, man, to see Bannon mention or have uh, oh, yeah. the book, man. Cool. That's, that's big wig stuff, dude. War Room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right on. So, so this show is going to be focused. We're going to be focusing on mainly political and economic aspects of the crisis, the virus, commie virus, Wuhan, whatever you want to call it. We'll get into that in a moment. We are planning to have a more medical show with some divergent opinions. We're going to have, I'm looking for some faithful Orthodox Catholics who are really thinking that the virus is you know, a serious, very serious threat, or maybe a little bit more pro lockdown, at least uh, conditionally. I'm, I'm talking to a few people. So, but if you are watching and you would like to defend the lockdown, defend more cautious measures, we're looking for your voice. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, our other contributor, Kennedy Hall, has produced a few videos that are very critical of the of the whole whole thing on a medical grounds. So, uh, we'd like to get those voices together. Going to get a, a nice show with some scientific people but this show is going to be a little, a little bit more politics and economics um and i wanted to start off with some important uh, in my opinion one of the most important points y'all make in this book is uh, about language and i just want to ask you gordon brothers what you think about the language as it is used in this whole crisis i want to read from uh this is page 35 you talk about how abortion is a euphemism or euthanasia you say uh for radicals Facts such as these, like child murder, must be circumvented with mendacious euphemisms if they are to win over the average American. It falls on retrogrades to push back against the lingual manipulation of radicals refusing to have our vocabulary dictated to us. And you say, language is a tool for communicating truth. If language is manipulated, then truth is manipulated. So first, I want to ask you, what's your favorite name for the Corona Kami Wuhan COVID-1984 virus? Can I, can I have first crack at that? Come on. Okay. <laughs> I, I came up with it just this morning, Tim and Jeremiah and Dave, and it's killer. Uh, and then that's Dave's rule, so I'll let him kick it off. Here's what I call you. Ready for this? It's a great unfolding. Call it the flu. <laughs> that's all. That's what it is. Except it's not very potent for, for people under 80. Right. The, the bat flu? No, I like the Wu flu because it assigns, you know, blame to China. It's like another one of those things that we can thank communism for. Uh, you know, we have all these atrocities in the 20th century and mass murder and destruction of religion and infiltration of the church. But to add to that, now no one's been able to work for like the last six months. So thanks, communism. We owe you one. Great. Wu flu. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... The the epoch the epoch times is the only uh, I guess church militant calls it the Wuhan virus. Uh, epoch times calls it the CCCP or CCP virus for communist Ch Chinese Communist Pirate Party virus. Um, but I I understand. Am I right in saying I believe it was the a WHO who called it COVID nineteen uh, at the suggestion of China? If I'm if I'm not mistaken, Jeremiah, you got a favorite? Well, I think the Wu flu is a good one. I don't mind the Wuhan virus. I think Wuhan is a it places it right, and it's uh it's not as it's not as fun, but it's it places it in a serious way. But I think the Wu thing is kind of interesting because it plays into the dynamic of it being this Wu do magic trick that's being done on everybody, and uh, so it's not just it's almost like W O O right the Wu virus, and you, where you see a lot of people, especially in the scientific community, they call themselves the scientific community that are 
pseudoscience through the roof right now. Uh, and just, you just flying by the seat of their pants every day, uh, making up stuff as they go along. And so I think the Wu virus is, is pretty fitting. I think, uh, that phrase you just used, the scientific community is, is one of the great phrases, uh, used what Gordon brothers, what do you, how do you guys see language being used in this crisis? Well, I think it's really you know, language is the main weapon in the Wu flu. I also like Kung flu, by the way. I also like the Who flu, WHO flu. I wanted to get that in. Uh, that was a, a tweet I had that I was quite pr proud of. The <laughs> WHO flu, because they're the guys that clearly cooked this thing up. Or you could just call it Fauci's flu. They uh, uh, Fauci has been manipulating the language so, so much, so uh, violently. They won't refer to it as the flu or a bad cold, when they talk about social distancing, which uh, the first time I heard that, I almost remember the date, it was late January, it was January 30 or 31. And I thought, what, what are you talking about? Um, I saw a great video the other day on YouTube that was titled, all commercials on COVID are exactly the same. Same piano music, same notes, same musical themes. Going, it went through something like a thousand commercials. And the talking point is social distancing does not mean we have to be distant socially. I've, I've yeah. seen about yeah. 75 spins on that since I started paying attention to commercials. Um, the idea is we're all in this together and we're all just supposed to be the good soldier that takes it on the chin and doesn't complain. I've been I've never been lectured so much by uh, grocery store clerks as I have been when I go to. Uh, the Vaughns near my house, we, we've been walking it. The, the point is that all of the good soldier imagery, we're all in this together, is mm -hmm. oriented to incentivize people to not be the first ones to open their mouth and say, this is government un enforced unemployment. It's worldwide government enforced unemployment. And it's uh, self-conscious pro-clutching where it's like hey don't be the first one to complain if you're waiting for your parents out in the hot car that it's it's a really clever trick that they're using and, and we, we can get to fauci hopefully more of the show but but it's the ultimate exercise in dave's language manipulation rule yeah there's yeah. A real emphasis and can you i sorry to interrupt gordon's can you guys talk a little bit louder or turn up your mic we're just still not transmitting well yeah. with what or, you or got. Sit, on, sit on each other's lap right <laughs> get, get real close and cozy you guys are brothers yeah, yeah Tim would like that anyway. <laughs> um, there, there's an emphasis on responsibility on making the individual feel the weight of all of society on his shoulders and it, it's almost it's a real collectivism in a way because we're being told that the individual has to sacrifice his life his job uh his family his total quality of life for the greater good of the community. So we keep hearing this word responsibility thrown around as if it was, as if it's irresponsible to want to be able to eat and to not want to crash the economy and to want to just have sustenance. And it's not. So we're being, it's a bludgeon that the left is using, that progressives are using to kind of keep us goose stepping along and towing the party line this word responsibility, because the the converse of that is that we're irresponsible. I don't want to be irresponsible. I don't want to be responsible for the deaths of a lot of old people. And I think there's, you know, there's a collective goodwill among Americans, Westerners, people who live in general, that they don't want to be responsible for causing somebody else's death. And, and obviously, that's, that's a good impulse. But the fact is, we could be doing all that we're doing in terms of social distancing, but for the people who are truly endangered by the virus, that is the old, the infirm, they should be responsible. They should keep their distance. I agree, but we shouldn't be making those who can add to society, who can, who need to provide for their families, feel irresponsible by simply venturing out and living. Uh, that's collectivism and it's collectivism as all collectivist mentalities are, it's collectivist at the expense of the individual. And it's like Bernays 101. 
I mean, propaganda. <laughs> Read Bernays. The idea of you know what what, what did who's he do? Ed Ber- Jeremiah, who's Ed Bernays for the audience, please? Bernays is uh, what was he the? He was related to Freud. Yeah, and he's he was the, nephew. The, yeah, he's the granddaddy. Forty-seven. Of, uh, he writes. I think it's forty-seven when he writes engineering consent. The yeah, psychoanalysis. Have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Propaganda is another one, right? In fact, it's a fantastic book for people who want to understand how this stuff works. But he he did this. Uh, There's kind of a um, a magic trick he did with a parade having women smoke and that they looked very independent. And you see this surge of it in the way that he used optics, the way that he used uh, language in order to manipulate uh, people's emotions. And really, that's what it was. It wasn't tapping into reason. It was tapping into people's emotions. And look, I, I went to school for journalism. That's the main thing that I do. And when I watch these commercials or I hear these news uh, groups using war language, that is forbidden. I mean, it, it, there's no class in America that I've ever known that says use wartime language like frontline or battle or any. You're not even supposed to use it in sports and in sports, in, in sports journalism for ethical reasons. And yet at the same time, it's common, right? They went to battle with each other, uh, that kind of thing. And or they were crushing this other person. We use those words w- w- talking about sports. But the sports journalist, from an ethics point of view, is supposed to abst- refrain from that. You can see commentators use it, but sports journalists, on the other hand, are trained to avoid it. Right now, they're just full-blown talking war language the whole time. And, and I thought about it. I said, you know, this whole thing about, well, we don't want to be responsible for death. You see this all the time in other arguments where they talk about air and water. And it, it, uh, leftists and Democrats saying... Well, you know, the Republicans just want the kids to to breathe in terrible air, you know, and put their mouths to exhaust pipes and kill them. I mean, it's just absurd, the whole thing. But, I, you know, the idea of being responsible for death, I've told a couple of my friends, I said, look, um, it, it, my daughter, when she had cancer, she was immunodeficient. That's what happens, man. Brain cancer does that to people. So we learned about this medicine called Pentam, where people... Once a month, they're going in and they're they're taking in this vapor. It tastes like garbage. They give you candy. Kids cry. It's a terrible experience, right? My daughter hated it. But she had to go because if you ended up getting uh, certain kinds of pneumonia, right, uh, or flu, it could be really lethal, right? High percentage of death for people with cancer. But nobody, nobody was saying, well, hey, everybody, a bunch of kids have cancer and it's flu season. So everybody put on masks and stay in your home. It was our responsibility. In fact, Make-A-Wish, when we went to the Make-A-Wish uh, Wish Ball, where my daughter was the highlighted ambassador of the year at the MGM Grand in Detroit, there's a picture of us in the limousine, and my son's wearing a mask. And the reason why he's wearing a mask is because it was our responsibility to do that, right? In that particular situation, she would wear a mask if she was going to school or something. But there was no collective co- conscience about... Uh, we need to behave a certain way or else we're murdering people, which is what uh, Governor Cuomo said. He's talking about, you know, you could actually murder somebody. This is just, it's novel. The whole thing is really novel. And that's interesting because they call it the novel coronavirus. (laughs) The whole thing is novel. Yeah, there's been definitely a a strong moralizing of a difficult situation in terms of the murder. There's there's been a strong... uh, assertion of culpability that you are actually murdering. I know, um, Dave, you've, you've done some moral theology. Can you speak at all to that in terms of, uh, how, how can somebody be culpable or not culpable for actually harming somebody, you know, being, uh, responsible for someone's death in the situation? Sure. Um, well, I mean, you can use three criteria and the church puts them in a couple different ways, but there's intense means and ends. And if you're going to be responsible for the crime of murder or the, the moral crime of murder, you have to willingly kill somebody um, to, to, to fail to do something. Obviously, there's two types of sins. There's sins of omission. There's sins of commission. If, if you're going to be guilty of a sin of omission, in that you're not doing something and murder of course is a sin of commission in that you are doing something with a specific mens rea a specific evil mind um but if you're going to be guilty of a sin that is a sin of commission there had to be a pre-existing duty 
uh, that you had to not act in a certain way. So if we're going to be talking about, you said Governor Cuomo um, is saying that to go out, to venture out of your house and to go to the store to, to buy something or to go to work to provide for your family, a livelihood for your family, then if that's uh, some kind of sin of omission where you're um, failing to act in accord with some duty, there has to be a duty present. And it's hard to fathom that there is a duty present to yourself starve or to fail to provide for your family so that there is a one in 1,000 chance or one in 2,000 chance um, uh, of somebody else dying. Uh, that's it's one in 2000 of accidentally causing a death versus uh, a one out of one chance of dying yourself or your family lapsing into severe destitution if you don't have food or a job. So they're trying to place a some kind of a moral duty where none can really exist. You know, we have a duty to look out for our, our neighbor's best interests insofar as it can be done in accord with our own interests, our own um, self-preservation. So they're kind of manufacturing a, a duty for us here. Yeah, it's great. I like I, that makes me think of what St. Thomas says when he's talking about almsgiving and he says you should give your excess wealth, your surplus, because you shouldn't just give away what is necessary for your wife and children. Um, one of the big mar sort of language that I hear a lot, like, uh, for example, Governor Whitmer um, of Michigan, uh, she's constantly saying, we're doing this to save lives, save lives, save lives. Uh, you guys have done some great work with Jason Jones on your ch channel about the threat to the poor and the vulnerable, actually. And uh, uh, Dave was just ch touching on that. Can you guys speak to that? Save lives. What does that even mean? Uh, who's who's really who's being threatened here? Are, you know, can you speak to that in terms of the poor and the vulnerable? Yeah. Well, so so the, the terms are real clear here, not to make too fine a point of it. The parts per million of dying is 0.9, less than one person. If you're aged 15 to 24, school age, high school and college age people, which are being shut down, less than one person per million will die of it, age 15 to 24, high school to college. If you get coronavirus, I, I'm coming around to the answer, but this is the, uh, I'm going to talk about B is less than PL here, a famous formulation by a district court judge named uh, Judge Learned Hand, he says B is less than PL. We're looking at the size of the loss and the probability of the loss here, loss of life. If you are under 40 and you contract coronavirus, these are these are WHO numbers. They just don't fly them uh, proudly. If you're under 40, have no pre-existing conditions, and you get coronavirus, your odds of dying are 1 in 50,000, which is lower than a common flu. Right, common flu. It's about one in thirty thousand or something like that. Um, if you're under fifty, no pre-existing conditions. It's uh, it, you cut that in half, so it's like one, or I think it's one in twenty thousand. So the odds are much smaller for anyone under fifty. Really, under sixty, they take a jump at sixty and under. But the affirmative duty not to uh, act recklessly or negligently with the life of another is so small. That what, what I was talking to Jason uh, Jones about is what's countervailing on the other end of the scale is, of course, our duty to provide for our own families and then really to to give alms to the third world, which is what what most of us do, where, where real destitution still exists around the, uh, the Horn of Africa. They're already seeing the poorest part of the world, by most estimations. They're already seeing the effects of this. Starvation is going to shoot through the roof. Even in the poorest parts of America, like Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, where Jason lives, they're already seeing this because they're two weeks out from any food shipments. That is um, the formulation I was talking about that he was wild about. He wants me to write this on the stream is uh, the burden to affect your behavior. It's a torts law rule is less than the probability of the loss. So think you know, if you're under 40 years old, it's one in 50,000. We're talking about loss of life. Probability of loss times somehow you have to quantify the relative size of the loss, which is loss of life. 
So very small P, huge L, it's loss of life, but it's such a small P that only a hypochondriac who's under 40 and healthy would worry about this, under 50 and healthy would really worry. Any really under 60 that's healthy, that doesn't have pulmonary issues or heart issues should not worry about it. What you ought to be worrying about is continuing your duties as a father, as a householder, as a husband, and as an alms giver to the poor parts of the world. And let me just add something here, Tim. You know, moralists in all, in all the moral theology guides, all the major ones, they treat inherently dangerous occupations. And the moralists all say that one can engage in inherently dangerous occupation for proportionally grave reasons. And among those proportionally grave reasons for risking life and limb, like maybe working on skyscrapers or uh, pick a dangerous job, maybe prize fighting for proportionally grave reasons, one can engage in this occupation. And among those grave reasons are providing for one's family. You have to have sustenance. So that's something where it's like, I'm thinking of a job where it's like one in 50 that in a given year, you're going to maybe die. Now, if you're shutting down the entire economy of the entire world, uh, you're going to have food shortages for everybody. People will actually starve without, you know, eventually the, the factories who make medicine will shut down. They won't be able to provide if you don't have a whole, if you take an entire link out of a chain of supply, everybody is affected, right? So just like in, we know in biology that if you just kill off an entire species or placeholder in the food chain, it's going to affect every single animal in the food chain and it can cause a mass starvation if you take one part of industry or another part of industry and you basically starve it for existence uh it's not able to act uh, according to the normal industry standard or it's not got the supplies it needs to carry on it's going to create a trickle down effect that cr that uh, impacts every other industry in the world economy, that will lead to mass death from starvation, lack of medicine, lack of materials for building, yada, yada, yada. So you have to, when you're talking about a worldwide shutdown, you have to say that there is a proportionally grave reason to go to work and, and to carry on as normal during this pandemic. And if there is, which there must be, because we're talking about not killing millions of people by the actual quote cure as opposed to um the the disease itself the cure here is worse than the disease then that's proportionally grave a proportionally grave reason exists to carry on as normal in that the cure is uh, far worse than the disease as we're seeing yeah it's it's very it's insane like e michael jones points out that in india there's a there's a whole massive group of people who are are dependent on not only paycheck to paycheck, but it's even more dependent than that. And they've started this massive migration to try to get back to their homes to try to get food. Um, but what about the uh, just to the you know what they answer is well, we're just going to send all these stimulus checks. Yeah. We're going to save everybody by these nice check in the mail, so you can you know take care of your family. You know we care about your family, right? So why, why, why can't that just fix it? Because you got to make the money. They're going to have to, they're going to have to borrow money and they're going to have to just print money. And, you know, as I was talking to my son recently, he made up a game for mother's day called city and he didn't do any kind of testing in advance. And so he had all of these little certificates with numbers on them. And I asked, him, what's the goal? And he said, it's the first person to a million dollars. And I started looking at the denominations and I thought, this isn't going to go very far, right? We're going to, we're going to run out of this. And, and he said, well, I can just make a whole bunch more. And we got into a conversation about what happens to money when you do that. I mean, there's some African countries, you know, it costs, you know, a couple million dollars for a candy bar, <laughs> you know, like, and it's not because of necessarily because of scarcity it's because their money is garbage. Okay. Um, they just keep printing loot, print loot, print loot. And so you're going to have this terrible effect on our currency. You're going to have to go out and borrow money. And really, the only country uh, postured in a way that's capable of doing anything remotely like that is China. 
And we're already beholden to them for so many of these things that we're learning. This is a real wake up moment for the United States on on. Right. Wow. Look how dependent we are on this group. And this is another one. Plus, any stimulus bill, any any time that they that they say, well, we're going to provide a stimulus and it's a, it's not just a bailout. It's a stimulus. It comes like lemon drops and lollipops at a parade, just passing out candy for this liberal wonderland uh, leftist. I should be careful. I've got liberals on the show. OK, you know, but leftists, man, you know, they, they it's sitting there and they just they're, they're passing out these socialistic lollipops to everybody. And and if you look and you break it down, Tucker Carlson had a great segment talking about breaking it down as to what they're putting in there in the bill. If it was just a single item and said, well, look, uh, we're going to give a, a, a stimulus check for the people who don't have work. People could debate that. I would. It's not going to be a good in the in the long run. OK, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it's never that. Never, ever, never. That's just not how politics works. And so that's how the propaganda about the policies work, where a politician gets on and says, well, this is what we're trying to do. And that's the extent of it. That's that's all they'll say, because they, they want to focus on the, the lofty things that make you feel good and secure and everything else. But the truth is, you get you start getting in there and you're going to see devil in details. And this has a whole bunch of demons in it. Now, is, is, that, is that really their plan? That that's they're just going to print more money. I mean, are they are they really <laughs> that obtuse? I, <laughs> just to be fair to them, I'm mean, like, well, where are they going to get all this money? They're just going to print more money. I, it's I thought, helicopter. Money. It's <laughs> helicopter. I mean, but this is this is what Keynes has, has bequeathed to the world. The only policy that's more uh, catastrophic to political economies. Then fiduciary pol fiscal policy is monetary policy, like Jeremiah there is saying. Mm -hmm. Quantitative easement doesn't work. It's catastrophic. It's Weimar Republic stuff. It's uh, literally destroying our dollars. And and uh, you know the example I use with my kids is, if we want to help Africa or we want to help uh, parts of Southeast Asia, they need food. They need homes. They need medicine. What do we do? Do we send food homes and medicine over there or, or raw materials? Yes. Do we just drive or fly a helicopter over and dump a bunch of U.S. dollars on them? No, because like you said, money, particularly, you know, fiat, fiat currency is just garbage. You know, it's, it's literal. It's litter. It's like, uh, you know, pornographic pamphlets on the streets of Las Vegas or something like that. It's not real wealth. We need to increase real wealth. And when they just print more money, it's the only way to piss away your economy quicker than than, you know, the Fed messing with the interest rate. The one bit of silver lining in all this is that now what, what Trump did the first week of the shutdown, essentially taking over the sole reason for being of the Fed. Now it's run by uh, the Treasury. Uh, the, the actual loans are now signed off on by the Treasury. So that might be good. Who knows, though? Yeah, I asked what you asked, Tim. What the heck is the plan? Like ever, all my friends with small businesses are in Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Well, I would float this. Well, we all know that if you just print money, it's going to drive massive inflation. And money, as also the first year student in economics will learn, and as Marx famously pointed out, has no intrinsic worth. So it almost seems, and you know, there's debates out there as to whether this was planned out, this pandemic, or caused, or purposely triggered. And you know, I'm very, I'm. Uh, perennially skeptical of conspiracy theories, but I do know, and this is in rules for retrogrades, that the left takes any crisis and tries to twist and use it to manipulate an outcome that they desire. So I am very skeptical. Um, I would say I would be tempted to assert that the left is using this perhaps to equalize wealth and to wipe out debt through inflation. It, at least that's a suspicion that arises in the back of my mind, because we all know what happens if you hamstring an economy for six to 18 months, you're going to have mass, either there's going to be uh, great government involvement, interjection in the economy, and there's just not that much that the government can do. I think uh, Winston Churchill once said that trying to spend your way out of a recession is like trying to lift yourself out of um, a hole by your own tail. You can't really do it. I don't have so, a tail either. Well, so just just a side issue. Yeah, that's uh, I should get that checked. <laughs> um, I've completely derailed and lost my train of thought now. Uh, we something about tails and holes.
rules. And it just sounds like he was assuming that everyone has one. Maybe. Yeah. Well, so <laughs> yeah. they, there might that, be a, what are you trying to say, lot. Dave? That's What's that's that? a that's offensive to the people without tails. Yeah. That that doesn't even work for them. You need to change your right. what you're saying. Seriously. Sorry, uh, but yeah. So the uh, yeah the the printing of the currency. I at the I saw. Um, in uh bill gates i can't remember if it was bill gates or fauci or whoever it was they were saying that we have to be uh you have to we have to take a little pain in the economy for 18 months for some better gain you know we get the vaccine or whatever and and it's easy for them to say obviously as they sit in their mansion or whatever you know they don't have actually they they can't take any pain it's it's just impossible for them to i mean they're they're doling out their money to charities or whatever uh but it would take literally billions for them to feel any pain. Uh, but uh, Jeremiah, you've, you've done a, you did a few um, digging on, on some of these governors and I want you to talk about Whitmer too, but can right. you tell us a little bit about the rich and the powerful, whatever governors and what they're doing or not doing uh, in terms of their own rules or their own uh, guidelines uh yeah. I think what were you saying? It was Cuomo who was uh, going to the gym or something. What what was no, up no, no. that? No, no, no. It was De Blasio. De Blasio. Yeah, De Blasio telling everybody you got to stay in, and, and of course, a lot of uh, uh, lecturing, these moralizing lectures, making everybody feel badly for not obeying the rules, and we're all in this together. You don't want to murder people. Stay at home. You know that kind of a thing. And then they go to the gym. You know, and he got busted not only for that, but he got busted going to a, a park like 11 miles from his home. He's, it's on video. You can watch it. And he's like, give it a rest kind of thing, you know. And the guy's like, I'm not going to give it a rest. You're not even opening up the, the roadways for all different groups of people. And here you are doing this. But when, when he got busted over the, the gym, one of his spokespeople came out and said something along the lines of, well, the gym has played a very important role in his life. And it's a very special thing to him. And I'm thinking, so what, dude? <laughs> like, people could say that about the ice cream parlor. Like, it doesn't matter, you know, that, that logic doesn't make sense unless you're really of the persuasion that the rules just simply don't apply to you, that you really are above the, the law because you're the lawmaker, right? That, that there are these kings and that they're above the law. You've got, uh, uh, not, just, not just with him, but you've got, what was it, the Illinois, his name Pritzker, the governor there, Telling people same thing, naughty all you people trying to get back to work. How dare you? Don't leave your home. And then his wife and kids, he puts his kids and his wife or whatever on a plane to Florida to spend time with the family. And when people, I got to give it up, mainstream media called him out and they asked him about it. And he goes, you know, what's, whatever happened to the day and age where people kept kept family out of politics? I don't think it's appropriate to answer that. And it's like, wait, you're demanding we answer for our families. Why can't we hold you to that account? But it's not just, you know, the governors and, of course, ours. Um, you know, it's quite obvious that she's making a pitch to be the vice president. I mean, it's, just, it's <laughs> what's going on. But I think of all the things that she's done that are absurd, other than, you know, of course, the uh, real demeaning tone. She's always it's like she's talking to a class of kindergartners. And we're all just these peon stupid dummies that don't know what we're talking about. And then she goes, look, you know, it's always how, how much she she personally knows. I know more than anybody else. And it's like, no, you actually don't. You really don't. You don't get it. Um, but she's uh, even beyond the press conferences where she's telling everybody that they've got to wear masks and she's not wearing masks. And we're in the same press conference where her hands are all over a podium that everybody else there has their hands on the podium when they go up to talk. Or the same exact press conference where when she's done talking and she turns around to allow somebody else to come, they bump into each other right after talking about social distancing with everybody. And they bump in and go, oop, oop. And it's funny because I was in the chat room. The local TV station does it live every time she does it. And I, and I posted on there, you know, how long, you know, what she was doing that it was really hypocritical. And one of her defenders said, well, you keep an eye on it and let us know how long it takes before she touches her face. Man, it was five seconds later, and she's rubbing her mouth with the hand that she just had on the podium. And I'm thinking, so I wrote five seconds. <laughs> That's what I wrote. And the person to their merit laughed. But what's most upsetting with her is the a repeated insistence that people will hear on MSNBC. And I actually have um, uh, pictures. If people are interested, I can I'll provide them to you, and you can share them. But um, the 
there was a, a an individual. She talks about there being Nazi symbolism and uh, swastikas at these rallies. There was one, and it was a flag that said Trump Pence, and it had a big swastika and it was a Nazi flag. That was not that picture was not even from a Michigan rally. Okay, it was in Boise, and it was done in February, not on March what, March fifteenth or whenever we had ours. And it was a liberal guy. You can watch the video. Andy No has it on, on Twitter. He shared the video of the guy holding it and then rolling it up and going back over. And he's wearing an anti, an, uh, uh, Antifa uh, shirt, right? And so about punching fascists and stuff. He's a Bernie supporter. The guy's a Bernie supporter. But he goes to these rallies and he stands in the middle of everybody, by the way, not wearing a mask. Okay, So he's out there causing all sorts of trouble. And that's bird dogging. And people may not know what that term is. Um, you know, uh, politicos and operatives know what that is. But bird dogging is fundamentally where you're uh, a rabble rouser and you're making it appear as if it's organic, but you're actually trained. OK, and, um, you know, there, there are high profile uh, cases of this. OK, and, you know, going back quite a ways, even to buses and grandmothers standing there just Grandmother is just showing up out of nowhere on a day when they're fed up with not having a seat on the bus. And you're like, oh, you were actually involved with uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. You know, you were involved with training operations and stuff. But these bird doggers are involved in this bird dogging, not only with the uh, bird dogging with the, the Nazi guy, but bird dogging even with the alleged nurses that are standing in the road protesting. If you go back to the original source of this, there's a. Uh, uh, a woman, a, a photojournalist who took the picture and she was asked if she where these people work. And she said, well, they never confirmed that they were even nurses or mm -hmm. where they were working. But it didn't matter because it was the message that mattered. And that was her position. And I said, that mm -hmm. is definitionally propaganda. It's also bird dogging. And you can watch yeah. people do a live video on the street where, where a, a nurse goes to the middle of a street to stand in front of a car photojournalist taking pictures and as soon as they snap that shot man those people leave and the person recording it said you're busted i caught you this is fake you you better not post that because i have proof that this is a setup that stuff's happening so i mean it's in, in the biggest case and this is the last one i'll mention there's a you could go on and on and on about the hypocrisy right even with neil ferguson the guy that came up with the two million people gonna die scenario having sex with his married mistress after he'd been infected right uh and and saying well i felt like i was immune within the two week time frame okay um but and she has children and a husband who unwittingly now were uh exposed to this as the wife was having sex with him um but most recently cherry health here in grand rapids michigan project veritas outed them they uh, news came in i think it was, CN, was it cnbc Came in, group came in, saw that there were hardly anybody. It was hardly anybody there, right? Lines were super duper small. And so they said, well, man, this doesn't look very good. This isn't sensational. And it's definitely not fitting the narrative. So they they talked to the staff, the, the management at the health center. And the, the management told the staff that was there for the day to take off the scrubs, get into their civvies, and get in cars in a line. And it made it this huge line of people, totally fake. And I, I, I knew of the story before yeah. I knew of the location and that it was in our town. <laughs> it blew my mind. But this kind of stuff is real. It is really happening. So whether it's the hypocrisy, you know, the, this idea of, well, the rules apply to you, but not to me. It's the same rigmarole that you hear all the time with this grotesque hypocrisy at that level. And most fundamentally, maybe on guns where they're surrounded by security, but they don't want you to have protection for your home, but they're important people. And so it plays itself out in a million ways. And I wish I had a, I wish I had a long time to talk about it, but there's just so many instances of it. It would take a, forever. So how, how is uh, California? How's your, your governor and mayor? Uh, I've seen some headlines, but haven't followed it. Is it pretty bad for y'all? We live in the, we live in the conservative enclave of California, the great central Valley, uh, specifically Bakersfield. So people here, they don't they don't wear masks generally speaking or they didn't start until a couple weeks ago they don't look at you funny for being out and about 
the sheriff had he said he's not going to enforce any of it. Pe people are out riding their bikes and stuff. When last month I was um, in passing through LA and, and <clears throat> essentially living in Orange County there at the, you know, in and out of the children's hospital, it was like culture shock because people at the grocery store were taking this seriously. I, I was laughing at them, you know, you going into surgery. Why are you wearing a mask? Look like in didn't come poop, you know? So that, that was the first time I'd really seen people out and about in masks was, you know, in liberal Los Angeles. I stopped at a couple stores there and then even in Orange County, which is not known as being, uh, not known as being as liberal, but um, there, there's a linearity to the uh, abidance of the mask rule and the social distancing rule. I think the more liberal the place you're in, the more people are going to be kowtowing it. I, you know, we're hoping to get things opened. I, I saw walking past the park the other day here in Bakersfield again, a uh, family just ripping through the yellow tape and putting their kids on the swings, which is, uh, I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> oh, sorry, that was me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's so it's, we live in the, the sensible place, but like I say, all 24 CSU campuses just announced earlier this week that they're not going back to school, which is nuts because why would you make this decision uh before you have to if it's if it's a dreadful thing to postpone classes and to, to go to digital because everyone complains of the lack of quality of education there why would you not wait until july or, or first week of august all of it totals up uh to something that is stinks doesn't smell right it stinks man it's so obvious something's going on uh, I, I don't think, last point here, I don't think it's a conspiracy theory. Look, all the, Ted Cruz is tweeting about it. Um, Trump is tweeting about it, that, that, that COVID, its origins, its ideology has been covered up. Tom Cotton was the first U.S. senator all over it. I mean, these guys are, uh, you know, not conspiracy theorists. Trump, uh, Ted Cruz literally said, there's enormous evidence that the WHO helped the CCP obfuscate the origins of coronavirus. It's it's absurd to believe that this thing is might have come from a bat somewhere. But but as Trump said, I think a week and a half ago, came from a bat in a lab. This is all but, you know, given right. at this point. Well, yeah. you know, I would just to Go tie ahead. something on. This, I think the reason you're seeing a partisan divide uh, with the response to the pandemic it's honestly because there is a cabal out there, the liberal cabal, is trying to take down the Trump presidency. So you're going to see the big blue states, the big liberal states like Michigan, like Pennsylvania, that are these manufacturing swing states that Trump carried in the 2016 election. They want their economies to, to be bad. I think that's truly what's going on. I think they want their economies to be bad. Because Trump is running on the economy. And this is a way of weaponizing this crisis, which is a rule for retrogrades. Um, the issue is never the issue. Uh, they're trying to bring down the Trump presidency or to at least use this to manipulate the crisis to bring down the Trump presidency. And if you have states like California and New York staying shut down for five months, four months, six months, there's no way that doesn't do lasting and irreversible economic damage. So, and same with Pennsylvania and Michigan, you're going to have a lot of disaffected workers. So the governors there are go of course going to be dissimulating saying, Oh, I'm just looking out for the, the common man's welfare. Um, but really they're using this as a political weapon. Now I want to ask you about that. Uh, and I want to we'll talk more about Trump in just a second. But I want to ask you, Gordons, again, uh, a little bit more about the partisan divide, because it is kind of interesting. And I think if you think about it, you know, if you set aside whether or not this is, you know, Freemasons or whatever, pulling the strings up top uh, and you just think of it in terms of like just group think just the mob following wherever they're led. It, it just seems to be a little odd when you just you make a an assertion about an empirically verifiable virus that's just out there you make an assertion and suddenly all of the democrats follow one assertion and all of the republicans follow another so just in terms of the populace just all the citizenry you know and, and there are counterexamples to this but there's certainly a strong groupthink i think 
uh, going on. Why, why do you think that there is just among the populace? I mean, are, are they just following the rhetoric here to want to unseat Trump? I, I don't, you know, it's, it's, I don't understand why there's just such a divide among the populace in terms of the virus. What do you guys think about that? I think some of the way it... Colleen... Go ahead. The way colleagues are. Oh, sorry. I thought I thought you said Gordon's. I, I... Oh yeah, Gordon's. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, Jeremiah. Uh, I, no, I look at as the perfect model of this. What doctors Masihi and Erickson, also from Bakersfield, California. I, I know these guys. They're, they're good dudes. When I met them almost a decade ago, I said those are two of the smartest doctors I've ever met. Super conservative dudes. Look at the attacks that they are bemoaning in their follow-up video uh, from their colleagues. Their colleagues are not saying your data is bad or your uh, your symptomology is bad or your interpretation of data is bad. No, their colleagues are literally attacking them by saying, these two guys, Masihi and Erickson, are well-known, really conservative Republicans, and it's a partisan thing. Why is that a first principle? I don't understand how it's axiomatic that if this were a real crisis, if this were a real <laughs> epidemic or plague, biblical plague, you know, that came from bats or wherever, it wouldn't automatically be partisan, even given the Rahm Emanuel you know, rule for radical that you know you always weaponize crises i think there would be have been this this is a symptomology of of the malady of of covid 19. um so it's an analogy within an analogy but i think you would have seen more banding together at the beginning of this automatically it was the first throughout january all of the news agencies were saying can we call this the trump virus and that led me to believe at the time that it was just about the trump presidency and whatever I think now it has more to do with even more darkling forces than, than keeping Trump out of the presidency. Uh, I, I think I think the fact that more than why, I think the fact that, Tim, uh, it's been so partisan right from the very beginning tells you everything you need to know. It tells you that it was uh, well understood, as Fauci said in, in uh, what was it, right before the Trump presidency began. He said there's going to be a surprise release. I've seen the video like 100 times on Twitter and elsewhere, there's going to be a surprise release, I think is the term he used, of a bad pandemic chronotype virus, and it's going to bring the world to its knees or something like that. Like, how do you know this? Every, what, what Jeremiah said is, is the best term for it. It's novel. It's unprecedented. And the fact of the um, sharp bipolar distribution of partisan lines, it doesn't make any sense otherwise. It might have taken us a, a couple months to gather into our tribes, a D by your name or an R by your name, collect your thoughts, you know, camel's a horse made by committee, and then let group think kick in and work its ills. That's not what happened. Everyone already knew right where to go, particularly those aligned with the worldwide left, which are those with these next to the well, names. I think on the level of the individual, though, I think the question if I, if I understand correctly, kind of has two parts. And that's, Tim is speaking here to the upper echelons, kind of the leaders, the ideologues, the, the font from which many of these ideas originate. Um, I would address just the rank and file, the hoi polloi, the plebeians out there, where there seems to also be a, a partisan divide. So you see, even just it's among true. the the foot soldiers of the left, you know, the guys that you bump into in, you know, just in the street, your, your liberal neighbors. Um, I think the reason there's kind of two reasons why you see a divide among the rank and file among just ordinary Americans. And it would be number one, there's an us and them mentality that has been fostered in America, partly because of the two party system that's so dominant and it's so baked into our constitutional cake here. Um, so we tend to have a real selection bias towards our guys, right? If our guys say something, we tend to, as members of this group, as members of the faithful, as orthodox conservatives or orthodox liberals, go with what our guys are saying. Just like liberal people tend to read the New York Times and conservatives tend to read the Wall Street Journal. At least, you know, that was the, the truism as of 15 years ago. So there's an us and them mentality and a real provincialism and like kind of team spirit. 
uh, that pervades Western politics, uh, where, where we're going to go with whoever's closest to our political ideology. Um, we're going to go with what they say. Then there's also, you know, ideas have consequences. So if people have bought into progressive political science, they're going to be more of the collectivist bent. Whereas if people have, are, are part of the conservative political team, they're going to be more in favor of individualism. So we're seeing kind of the consequences of collectivism versus individualism trickling down. The collectivist would say that a body part has to die for the good of the whole. So if it means, you know, for the good of the Western world, for the good of these elderly people or the people who are most at risk, or those with pre-existing conditions, if it behooves their health for everybody else to kind of starve to death, for individuals to starve or lose their jobs or lose, you know, whatever else is going to be lost in the course of a nationwide economic shutdown that lasts a significant period of time then that's tough rocks because the, the uh, societal good trumps the individual good. Individuals are going to say, well, you know, I have my own human dignity. God, I uh, personally, I'm made in the image and likeness of God, and I have rights. You know, groups don't have rights under the Constitution. Individuals enjoy rights under the Constitution. So they're going to be more quick to assert those rights and to say, this is costing me and my family. Uh, also, there's, you know, conservatives tend to be Christian and uh, Christians tend to be very pro-family. The family is the first and vital cell of society. So we know that there, the family needs protection. The family has a right to being sustained and to having um, provisions made for its continued existence. So, of course, conservatives are going to be quicker to assert their rights. So there's the... Um, first of all, the us and them mentality, and then there's, second of all, just the trickle-down effect and the playing out of these political ideologies. I, think I was going to say, first of all, let me clarify something. Earlier on, I was talking about the grandmother. Um, for those who are unaware, Rosa Parks, uh, and it wasn't the Southern Poverty Law Centers, the NAACP, and if people want to know more about her nonviolent civil disobedience training at Highlander Folk School in Tennessee, they can go and read The New Thought Police by Tammy Bruce. Um, but I was going to say, you know, talking about why we're so divided, there's a really great book, and people can disagree with some of the, he's, uh, he believes in evolution. I know a lot of the viewers do not. Um, but uh, he, he, Jonathan Haidt, in his book, Righteous Mind, Why Good People uh, Disagree Over Politics and Religion. Uh, it's a, a stunning book, in fact, in talking about the moral foundations that people have and how that kind of works its way into group dynamics. And that we're tribal by nature. You know, it's a team sport, especially politics is a team sport. But that you have different moral foundations at play for someone who may be a, a secular person. He calls it weird. Uh, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic. Okay. Um, and so keep up with the acronym. Right, right. And so he's, he, that's his idea with that is to say that that's a very weird position, even globally speaking, it is. Um, but especially when you get on the left and he, he's uh, favorable, in fact, toward conservative people, he says that conservatism has an advantage. But this ultimately plays itself out and fleshes itself out in groupishness in ways not just partisan in the way that we say, well, you're politically aligned with this, but in other ways that we all know. And that would be, for example, um, mm -hmm. the siloing effect that takes place with uh, media consumption. And I remember uh, The Daily Show um, back when it was good, uh, or at least decent. Um, was it ever good? Yeah. Kind, it was at least kind of funny, I guess, if you were high enough. But, you know, the thing is, is that they... Uh, he had a, a graph that had a list of of um, different media outlets, and it was this this broad based study that was done to find out who do you rely on for your uh, your views, and it was just split. I mean, hard. Nobody nobody on the right's reading Mother Jones, right, or the Nation, and nobody on the left is like, hey man. You know, let's go check out Fox News today and watch Sean Hannity, you know, or let's listen to Michael Savage or something. And you see this major divide. So they're 
the consumption of news and narratives that they're receiving are extremely different. And this plays itself out. A lot of individuals in the modern era or secular age say, well, science is different because science, you're playing with numbers and you can't, you know, two plus two is four. It's that simple. And so you can't you can't trick it. You can't spin it. You know, people should have recognized it was interesting enough. Bill Gates, there's a picture of him uh, where he's got a, a selection of books that he's reading. And interestingly enough, one of them is how to lie with numbers. Numbers. I yeah, thought. right. Yeah. And uh, so, that's just incredible. <laughs> so the idea that you can't spin a narrative with that is absurd. Um, trying to remember the guy's name. Uh, uh, Jewish guy out of Harvard, Steven Pinker has a book called The Blank Slate that talks about this. E.O. Wilson, uh, the way E.O. Wilson was treated and has been vindicated in the scientific community, in fact, uh, over group selection, the, the way that he was just maligned, right? And, and they spun this web of, of numbers and everything. Said, oh, this, this is the way it is. And then come to find out it's wrong. I mean, look, look at the way, for example, that we're all old enough to remember when uh, there was this real push of the idea that there's no such thing as race. And the same people who say there's no such thing as race are now like uber racist SJW types that are super tribal on the racial score and saying like, yeah. hey, you know, uh, marginalized people of color. And you go, there's no such thing as race. Well, that's just crazy fascist. And you're like, well, wait a second. <laughs> you know, you're the same people yeah. that a while ago. And yeah. you were saying that's science. And you were bashing people saying that's science. Same thing with the idea against group selection, saying that's science. And look at what's happening with Fauci. How often has he been wrong? So people who say, well, I'm relying on science. Really, it's like a messiah complex where they're relying on, on people like Fauci or Neil Ferguson. But they're saying, you know, for one, remember the model, again, the IHME model and Ferguson's model uh, talking about Two million people dying, and and if we if we don't do anything, and one million if we do the crazy hardcore Wuhan type stuff, it's still one million people dying. Um, and that was later uh, th that was used. These models were used um, in deciding whether or not to do this draconian shutdown that we're doing. But then later, um, after insisting that we need to follow these models, later Fauci was the guy that said you really can't rely on models. And so this is in real time, and so. If people are saying, well, I'm relying on this, this, this method, which is, okay. I prefer that method. I came on the show last time we talked about this and said, I, I'm, I believe in, I'm a science guy. I like science. I like the method. I think it's a reliable way of looking at things, but not in real time, day to day to day, which is why the doctors, and I'm so glad you guys brought it up, uh, the Gordon bros. I'm so glad you brought it up because I saw that you had tweeted that you knew those doctors that came out to talk about an analysis of numbers uh, from different places all over the world, which if you only heard mainstream media sources, it was it was that they only took tests from their one clinic and just extrapolated that to the planet. Right. Is, right. What do you want? I watched the whole thing. Right. So I, I, right away, I said, these people are lying, but they're professional statisticians right. and stuff. And I said, they're, they're just a bald faced lie about this. Right. Um, you know, but they at least had hindsight to say, OK, we've been at this game for months. We have it all over the world. We can we can weed out the things that if it's just day by day by day, it's a blur and we kind of easily forget what's behind us. But if we say, all right, let's let's transcend this and then look down into a bird's eye view, a meta analysis of all this. What does it come up with? That's the scientific method, by the way. OK, that science. And so, you know, but people are so caught in the day by day by day blur of of timelines and social media and what's trending right now that that whatever's coming in the moment, that's just science. And it's this ever evolving, uh, uh, um, completely perfect thing. Right. It's, it's yeah. infallibility. <laughs> it is. It's like they're infallible. It's an infallible priesthood. Go ahead, Dave. Every day says they're wrong, but they're always yeah. right. Yeah. We're in a day and age where the word science has itself become deified. And it's a very dangerous thing, actually, this deification of the term science that's very post-enlightenment and all that good stuff, where people hear science and they're like, this is infallible truth, right? This, we've come to a point where we're at an almost scientific fideism because the average man out there, the average like Western plebeian out there, 
here's science, he attaches infallibility to it. But he knows nothing about science or statistics. Uh, and it's dangerous because that makes him all the more pliable and manipulable by kind of the, the heads, the talking heads, the punditry, who, uh, who can really distort truth by quoting science. You know, I could tell you, well, based on uh, a dozen readings or 500 readings or any, you know, accurate sample size at, in Antarctica, that the worldwide temperature is negative 60 degrees on average. It's like, well, you have to know a thing or two about statistics and accurate sampling in order to, to really be putting your trust in some of these scientific experiments and tests that are being run, these statistical analyses. People really need to get into the weeds and say, okay, I trust this uh, statistical analysis based on the fact that it seems like a sound uh, scientific experiment and sound number crunching. But very few people have the time, the discipline, the training to do these things and to look into the background and the criteria of these scientific tests. So that lends itself to the media being able to say, oh, well, science says this, like as if science is this, um, you know, anthropomorphized person who's just infallible and inerrant. And then everyone's like, well, science says it. Science says global warming, so therefore it must be true. And they're not looking into how this uh, scientific consensus is being arrived at and what criteria these scientists are using to adjudge uh, a given thing, like a given uh, outcome that, they're, that they are uh, positing. Well, they so don't know really that there, there is no consensus on global warming. Sure. They don't know because they don't have they don't have the training in the well, empirical it's a farce. analysis. You know, I obviously I, I know that global warming is a farce. I'm just saying that we have uh, in this brave new world, in this strange new era, we have arrived at a place where we can now have scientific fideism, where people are just putting blind faith in science. So we're we're like fundamentalist scientists scientists yeah that that is that is such an excellent point uh it's and it goes back to the language we talked about in the beginning the, the scientific community says this a new study finds this it makes me think of uh orwell says uh quote the whole climate of thought will be different in fact there will be no thought as we understand it now orthodoxy means not thinking not needing to think orthodoxy is unconsciousness end quote is a is just pure irrationality pure irration irrationality pure emotion is what drives i mean they, they can't make profits in media out of having a rational debate that's that's that is boring nobody wants to watch that uh but we will in fact have a rational debate about this between science scientists on this show uh god willing in the next few weeks where we will have divergent opinions and we're actually going to talk data and empirical evidence and things like that. I'm like I said, if you can talk about how bad the coronavirus is, please contact me. Uh, but I wanted to get everybody's take here. What do you think the enemies of Trump? Uh, what is their plan? I, I heard Ferrara mention uh, that he thought that they were going to try to. Oh no, I think it was uh, Mike Church actually. Um, they were going to try to shut everybody down, make them all vote by mail, and then just sort of call the election and say there's there's no way to count them all. So then we have to put it back in the, in the in the House of Representatives, and then we can get Biden and Whitmer in there or whatever. So what what do you guys see as their plan? What are they even planning? How are they going to pull this off? They've tried so many other ways to get them out. Uh, what's the plan? You think? Well, look look at the bill. Uh, you know, what is it? Um, House this, bill, six, mark six, of the six, beast, six, whatever, like that, yeah. right? Right. Um, direct payment, uh, unemployment insurance, rental and mortgage help, food assistance, student loan assistance, among other things, um, including uh, on top of the usual spending. And by the way, this is like two trillion dollars. This uh, the additions to this. Uh, the last one was two trillion. This one's three trillion, which is 90 percent of our annual tax revenue. Twelve hundred dollar checks to illegal immigrants. More low, uh, low wage labor from abroad, legal and illegal amnesty for the duration of the crisis. And this includes because they said, well, for essential services. And by the way, they, they, it listed here 
food service, laundry, child care, transportation, waste management, agriculture, restaurant, retail for any location selling food or beverages. So are they just creating a, a communist Democrat state out of this whole? Is that what you're saying? Lemon drops and pops, man. And, and it's it's a perfect opportunity. Hillary said it. Uh, there's a number of these people. UN director said it. This is a uh, this opportunity, this really rare chance that we get to exploit a, a crisis right, and to use it to our advantage. And we saw this happen with the Patriot Act. And look at the kind of stuff that's come out of that. We're dealing not just with this crisis. We're dealing with the unloading of tons of information regarding uh, the the spying on the Trump campaign 2016. We're seeing that unfold right now. And this stuff goes well, back get- to a time where where they were doing the same exact stuff. You know, and look at what happened with with Obama and Rahm Emanuel, not letting a good crisis go to waste types type thing, you know, but it's not just that it's it's uh, prison break provisions. Right. Which orders the release of every federal prisoner who has asthma, diabetes or is over 50 unless evidence of potential violence against a specific person. And lastly, is the one million to the National Science Foundation to study coronavirus misinfo. OK, and so <laughs> you're sitting there saying, man, this is like this this wonderland for for leftists at this point and and to push this as far as they can and use this. And they could, you could even say that there's elements of this that are legitimate. Like I'm I'm actually I take it a little bit more seriously, maybe than, than you guys do on some of this, even with mild uh, symptoms and stuff. I'm one of those guys that takes I'm more like a Cernovich type person on this issue. Um, but to take that issue and then to ride it like a unicorn, right? And say, I'm just going to ride this wild thing for as long as I can. And I think that's what's happening here is they're using a crisis that that may or may not be super dupe dupe bad, but they're using that in a way that is super dupe dupe bad. What, what do you guys think? What's the, what's the plan? Gordon's? Well, I agree with Mike Church's analysis. Um, it's a, I think it's a, a, a damn good guess what, what they're going to do with the, the um, offline voting. I think an offline, um, in, uh, a world currency that's offline, world trade that's essentially all online. And uh, I think it's a major step toward, toward globalism. It's cultural globalism. If we take a step back, right, take a, take a 50,000 foot view of this globalism is simply everyone in the world reacting to talking about writing about you know enjoying commentary from commentators about the same thing at the same time in the same way and that this is unprecedented like jeremiah said it's novel like this is globalism anywhere you go any business you call has the same excuse coronavirus sorry uh, extra long phone lines, coronavirus, every commercial, as we already talked about, we're all in this together, coronavirus, anything you, anything you do, school, entertainment media, news media, commentated, this is all being channeled in the same direction. It's all coronavirus. We're all talking and thinking in the same, uh, on the same wavelength. They're going to take that and they are taking this, uh, this particular direction of thought, and they're going to, I think, channel it into more aggressive means of uh, socioeconomic globalism. I think this was the plan all along. It's been frightening how many people are goose-stepping to their tunes. And I just think kind of like what we, we've, I think, Tim, you and I, Dave, I'm, I'm not sure, Jeremiah, we've all said about the Francis Pontificate I think they're surprised how much pushback they're getting. I think they thought this was the time to do it. Uh, the time is ripe, as GWF Hegel would always say. The time is ripe. We can do this now. I think they're surprised how, how quickly the, the uh, shrewd conservatives of the world said, no, we're going to push back. We need to go back to work. We need to go back to school. We need to go back to church. After Easter, I was tweeting about it. We're, I'm done. Now, Trump, what he needs to do is to look at Fauci and Burks, uh, have another look at Ferguson and say, you're fired. You know, you're off the team. I don't know what is protecting this man, particularly Fauci. He's been there for five administrations. This is the Teflon Don. I want to see him say, you're fired. You're no longer in charge of anything as far as I'm concerned. Admin law, admin uh 
policy making. And we need to just forcibly go back. It, it might be the revolution that I was insinuating in Catholic Republic. We, we are America. All of the resistance is coming from us, no surprise, but that people are going to have to rise up and forcibly go back. Right. Uh, and in addition to just the more quotidian destruction of federalism that we're seeing with the expansion of the federal government at the expense of states' rights and kind of the, the governors, the leftist governors who are banding together in the big states to create kind of a uniform regime that transcends state boundaries of curtailing personal liberties. Beyond just that stuff, which is menacing and thoroughly dangerous in and of itself, so I don't mean to treat it lightly when I call it anodyne and quotidian, that's just the typical leftist mischief. So we're all kind of desensitized to that in the first place. We are now having the global agenda really being dictated to us by the WHO, who receive significant funds from China and there are kind of a puppet regime of China. So it's a way for uh, to, to create a uniform consensus, a uniform outlook uh, globally and have it be dictated by like the arch progressives in a way over in communist China. Beyond that, I think that there's another uh, nefarious political play taking place right now in America with because Biden is so weak. I see this, you know, the left sees Trump as target number one. They want Trump gone. They're desperate for it, especially with uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg going to the hospital like every other week or two. You know, I, I check the Drudge Report every morning like this will be the day. Can we get that wicked old bag off the Supreme Court for the good of every unborn baby in, you know, the whole of America? But she's in the hospital every other week. So the left is desperate. You know, they're panicking about getting Trump out so that, the you, you know, we don't get a firm conservative block on the U.S. Supreme Court, which would end Roe v. Wade and deal, you know, if, if abortion is really the lifeblood of feminism, it's the anti-sacrament that sustains the unholy spiritual life of feminism then it's going, the end of abortion is going to curtail feminism in many ways. It's going to be a death blow to it, and they can't, uh, they can't sustain that. They can't abide that. So they need Trump out. I think what we're seeing and why we're seeing the left create this narrative of a hero in Governor Cuomo is that he's going to be the man tapped to possibly replace Biden if uh, more scandal comes out about Biden, if some of these accusations, uh, you know, they're solidified, they are, uh, and they tend out, they tend to be veritable and truthful accusations, or at least it looks overwhelmingly like they are, then I think we're going to have the, the leftist coronavirus hero, uh, Cuomo, tapped to take Biden's place on the ballot. So I, I see that too happening. Right on. So let me, I, this, I want to get everybody's take. What do you think? And then, and then, uh, viewers, if you want to ask any questions or comments, please share those. Uh, so what do we practically do? We're all fathers here. We got children, we got wives. What do you do? Practically speaking, are we hoarding food, guns, weapons, ammunition? You know, are we banding together with the neighbors? What, what are you guys doing? Gordon's, what, what are you guys doing to plan for or deal with this, practically speaking? Well, if the time is ripe, and it might be, then it's kind of our, our numbers up. Yeah, you, you have to have, you should already have lots of guns. You know, I do. should already have food storage. I have a moderate amount. I, I should have some more. And if they're truly going to keep us out of churches and workplaces for really any longer, then people need to just start, you know, going back to work forcibly, start with civil disobedience, you know, the imagination um, can steer from there. It, it, it has to at least start with civil disobedience and fill in the blanks as you go forward. I mean, one funny thing is homeschooling is the natural uh, recipes in all of this. 
because you know people are naturally moving to homeschooling it's very convenient and it's addictive once you start doing it not having to have this puritanical weekly schedule like little little uh 45 year old worker be kids when they're five six seven it's it's lovely you just keep them at home they can go to bed later everyone's chill the, the, harvard is having a harvard mag is hosting uh, an event later this month to basically uh fend off the natural allure of homeschooling that's sweeping the nation as a natural mm -hmm. uh consequence of COVID 19. so at the very least try out the homeschooling do it it's lovely you'll like it the left is freaked out about that one. This is that's one inevitable ramification of all of their uh, skullduggery vis-a-vis -vis COVID nineteen. But aside from that, just get ready. I mean, people have to ready themselves. If our time is up and um, seventeen seventy six is approaching again, you got to kind of check yourself. As I always check my friends that come over for a Fourth of July barbecue, I always say, "Hey, man, are you? Do you believe that this?" really means something here we're celebrating do you believe in july 4th 1776 or is this a one and done deal do you believe thomas aquinas the first thinker in human history to really openly endorse the right of rebellion do we do we take this really seriously when a government becomes unjust and self-abolishes the you know its own justification for rule and people usually don't know what to say i'll be honest with you they don't know what to say like yeah, I want to say that I'm celebrating the 4th of July for more than like fattening foods and fireworks. But, you know, you got to push them on this. We're, we're men. We have to be willing to put it all on the line. You know, lives, fortunes, sacred honor for what we say we believe in a republic, you know, which is governed by, you know, the, the commandments. We have to do what we can. And I, our time might actually be up. Normalcy bias notwithstanding. I think we might actually see some real action here. Well, as Patrick Swayze says in Roadhouse, be nice until it's time to not be nice. And that's the rule to Good live point. by. You go through, uh, it always spoke right to the heart. Um, you go through all of the proper channels, all of the representative de democratic channels um, in making your voice heard to your politicians. But an unjust law is no law at all. And when people are curtailing the economy for what is turning out and looking more and more like a minor, minor disease that is not virulent in and of itself, that's not very potent, that's not going to be killing uh, many people at all. And the cure that is being foisted onto us by these strong men in their governor's mansions um, is actually that cure is much worse than the disease then it's time to practice civil disobedience. The police, the National Guard, they can't arrest us all. So I'd say in about a week, it's time for every, and I am right now am being kept from a job. I have a job offer that I'm being, I, I'm being on hiatus for until a certain state's economy opens up. So I'm ready to go, I'm ready to start a job, and it's directly affecting me right now. So I'm not just engaging in idle blather. I know of what I speak. And it, you know, I'm encouraging everybody, perhaps in a week or so, it's time to just open the economy back up by hook or by crook. If you own a small business, open it up in mass. This can't just be like we say in rules for retrogrades, the monolithic boycott where consumers are like, I personally am not going to, you know, go to the Macy's Corporation because they have this policy that I disagree with. No, you have to band together with like-minded people. Uh, you have to aggregate your voice or else it will never be heard and you are going to be arrested and made an example of. And as they say in, in uh, Dead Poets Society, you know, sucking the marrow out of life doesn't mean choking on the bone. Now, sometimes you have to be a red martyr or a white martyr, but you also, I'm telling you men out here, you have to be prudent because there are fathers of families where you can't leave your family high and dry and be thrown in prison. You also can't be fined to death so that you can no longer provide for your family's men. So you have to do this smartly. But if you band together with like-minded men, there's no way the police are going to be able to arrest 100 million Americans. Go out there and get to work in cooperation 
with your neighbors, in cooperation with your fellow churchmen, in cooperation with your friends, and they will not be able to do anything to us. They can't arrest us all. They can't fine us all. And if people in mass refuse to pay fines, what are they going to do? As there's the famous um, adage to the Supreme Court, when the Supreme Court was, was really acting ultra virus outside its powers, uh, who, what president was this? The president of the United States said, you've you've made this decree, now enforce it. Wasn't it so Andrew Jackson? Yeah, Jackson. Jackson. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, enforce it. The... Try and enforce it on 150 million screaming no Americans, right? right. And, and that's the way to do it. Civil disobedience. So right now, go through the political channels. I think we're reaching critical mass. We're reaching that threshold where men of the nation are going to need to rise up, link arms, and be like, we're doing mass civil disobedience. So, uh, you know, the little governess of Michigan and uh, Gavin Newsom of California, you can eat our shorts. We're going to do what we're going to do. Yeah, t uh, yeah, absolutely. T um, Timothy, I want to get get your take on this question. You've been through a lot personally during as this crisis has been going on and we all thank god that uh, abby's doing really well and yes. we'll continue to pray for you and your family um nick rayberg says uh how do you keep your peace what do you meditate on yes the battle's already won but what about all the suffering and pain my children will go through uh so tim what how do you get through this kind of i, I guess that's kind of on a spiritual level if you'd be willing to share well, prayer and fasting i, I thank god Abby had a brain surgery. A lot of people out there were under the misapprehension that it was brain cancer, like um, like Jeremiah's kid. That that uh, that that's worse. Uh, Abby, this has been an all life thing. The reason I don't have my doctorate from the Greg is because Abby was born out there in Rome with um, a couple in in utero strokes, hydrocephalus, and um, um, some some after effects, some secondary effects like cerebral palsy and epilepsy. So uh, this so the, the, the surgery that she went through that put us in um, Children's Hospital of Orange County around Easter was not like removing a tumor. It was a big, big time brain surgery. Uh, it was actually hemispherectomy to remove the part of her brain that was causing her seizures. So there's a little more stability to it, I guess, than, than having cancer. I mean, that, that, that uh, I became a major hypochondriac after Abby first, after we returned to the States. You know, like these, uh, you know, weary travelers. We came back with a kid we didn't have when we went out there. It was just me and my wife to go get this doctoral degree. So, uh, you know, I became a major hypochondriac of cancer, vis-a-vis uh, -vis cancer. And that's just the one where you have no stasis. I wonder, the question you're asking me, Nick, is what I ask of all parents of, of um, cancer kids. That's what, you know, I was kind of saying this to Jeremiah privately, it's like, man, this is, that's the, the, the turbulent, that's the storm, you know, that's the crisis is your kid gets cancer or, or a person gets, a young person gets cancer because it's so without a rhyme or reason. Abby, luckily, we, we've always known, you know, we have the meds, once she's having breakthrough seizures on the meds, it, it, uh, it looked like it was time for action and it was this big brain surgery and she's doing really well. By the way, she hasn't had one seizure in five weeks, she was having something like four years before that. Oh, yeah, praise, praise God. Man. Yeah, man. man, praise God. Yeah, so it worked. So that that helps. But yeah, prayer and fasting is the only thing that that'll that'll get you through when you're having a real hard time. And uh, Jeremiah could probably speak to it better than me, actually. Jeremiah. Well, yeah. Uh, at the time when we were going through that, I wasn't I wasn't loving the Lord um, at the time, but there's no doubt looking back the prayer got me through and it's one of those things man where a lot of people pray for you and even though you may not believe in it god is god's there and you can look back and thank him for that for not leaving you entirely to your own devices um you know but but things like you know and i'm doing them now so some of the things that i did back then and now adding to that prayer adding to that fasting adding to that doing uh praying the liturgy we do that every sunday and so we, we were originally watching it online together as a family, and I'm not going to dog that, uh, but we decided that we wanted to just simply read the Mass together uh, at our home, uh, just with us. And so we've been doing that. Um, 
but other things too that, you know, right before it was like months before this happened, I quit smoking. Right. And that, that's a, that's a much overdue making good on a promise to my daughter who insisted that I, I stop smoking. Um, but uh, when that happened, I, I was amazed. I said, man, I, I stopped smoking. I didn't gain any weight. Weight is a tricky thing. Right. And I ended up gaining. I just, I, I ballooned up, you know, and then, and then this whole lockdown happens. And I realized I said, man, I got to get back to that zone that I was in at the time when my daughter was dying. And some of the things that I did and some of the things I'm doing now above and beyond what I've already mentioned, um, playing music, you know, I've got a guitar. I love guitar. Um, wa watching and analyzing film or music and not just, you know, I enjoy it just to, just to sit down and enjoy it, but taking the time to think critically about it too. Uh, picking up the pen and pencil uh, to begin drawing again and using my hands uh, to go on walks. I've got a St. Bernard, you know, so going on walks with our dog, Coco, um, being outside and doing uh, high intensity interval training, right? Watching what I eat and saying, okay, if I, if I'm being selective and I'm ordering food for them to bring it on in and stuff, then I can pick what I want. I'm going to, I'm going to be more selective about what I'm eating and everything and take this opportunity to go, you know what, I'm not going to let this get the best of me because it'd be easy to just sit in front of a TV all day long and just blow it up like a balloon. I mean, that would be super duper yeah. easy, you know? And uh, so, yeah. so to sit there and do high intensity interval programs, uh, interval training. And I did that. I did. In fact, today I'm trying to remember what I did today, man. It's this, I, I don't know. Uh, it's not Iron Man training. I forget what it is, but the, the man maker, the man maker, you want to, you want to do something that's going to make you breathe heavy, you know, and do that three, three to five times a week and take it slow. It's like 20 minutes each time, you know, you can do this and, and to get your life in order. And lastly, to work, you know, I've, I've been saying for a while, you know, I've only got a handful of chapters left in my book and my book is done. And this book is awesome, by the way, if I can say so myself, <laughs> but th the truth is it's totally dope. And and it's it's been a real pleasure to, to write. It's also been extremely painful. It's about my daughter's life and death with cancer and how that ultimately led our family back to the Catholic Church. Um, and so it's this it's a beautiful tale. And I'm, I'm at the tail end of it, you know, and I, I interviewed somebody I was doing. I have a show where I interview um, people who write or people who are involved in movies. And I was interviewing the guy who's the author of Bird Box, um, the movie that was on Netflix with Sandra Bullock and stuff like that. I was interviewing him and he was talking about how he, he got through this book by basically locking himself in his room for a weekend. And he just crunched out like 10,000 words. I mean, just or more than that, 30,000, something huge, a gigantic number. Uh, and he finished his book. And I, I've I've thought about it. <laughs> I've, I'm uh, anticipating buying a lock for the basement and saying, all right, kiddos, I'm gone for a couple of days. Uh, and lastly, you know, so to finish the book and have that sense of accomplishment and to con to to treat my work uh, as St. Jose Maria Escriva said, to treat it like a liturgy and that you, that you are the priest of that liturgy. God gave that to you uh, to do the best you possibly can with, to treat that as if you are offering that up to, uh, to God as a sacrifice and that is yours to do. And to try to begin implementing those, those ideas into my life and into my practice. And I would encourage others to do that. So whether whether it's music, whether it's art, whether it's spending time with family or going on walks or whatever it is, uh, all of those things or any of those things to do them to the glory of God, with the best of your might, in spite of all of the hardships we're going through right now, that is, I believe, the key to success and to dealing with this and overcoming this in a way that's not just good for right now, but is good for generations to come. That's yeah. such a better answer than mine. I mean, that's a beautiful <laughs> <laughs> no, because what I love is you have the nice mixture of the, the, the natural and the supernatural and to say just prayer and fasting, there's a certain uh, disingenuousness to it because you do that, but there's also the natural virtue. We were we were talking beforehand about like two years ago, I started collecting basketball and football cards again, which is the way I got through anxiety as a kid. And, uh, and also I, I retook up skateboarding. I was both Dave and I were pretty decent skateboarders. It's something in my summers as a teacher. You know, I go out there with, with my kids who have scooters and we'll, we'll go out at night and skate school. And uh, it, yeah, so, I mean, there are natural and supernatural artes associated with overcoming anxiety. Your, your answer is still much better, but that, that's beautiful, man. By skating at school, you mean like ollieing and falling over hard? And breaking? <laughs> I can't do it anymore with skating. I, 
Yeah, you saw me uh, actually I posted on Twitter like a video of me when I was in high school, early high school, doing like a very old heel flip. And then me and Tim were out just dinking around the other day with our skateboards, and I, I like hit a pebble and just fell over and broke my shoulder. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's great. This this is a great uh, note to to kind of wrap up on, though. Uh, Gordon's, you you guys got any final thoughts uh, before we kind of uh, call it a night at this point? I'm out. Just- just man, God bless America. We're, we're you know we're the last resistance as always in in the world. We got a million problems, but we, you know we're called upon to be the city on the hill and to be the last resistance. And, and we've got the closest thing there remains to extant, real remnant men. And and so therefore it's it's going to fall on our shoulders. This is a darkling plot, either ideologically or as a secondary kind of development. It's our time. It's our time to go out there and work lead the world the way america does i know the europeans uh, hate this but it's true lead the world come back to work go back to church and uh let's roll let's yeah. get america going yeah and you you know the left uses all crises for the advancing their agenda first of all stanch the advancement of the leftist agenda but use this to advance the truth or Christianity, right. uh, the conservative way of life. Use this, and there was an Atlantic article not too long ago saying this is terrible for feminism because women are now staying home and they're getting a taste of the domestic life of which many of them have been robbed by uh, kind of the mom jeans wearing butch haircutted iron steel-toed boots feminists of the 60s who told them that staying at home is not satisfying and that you're going to be bored and grappling with ennui and you're not going to feel a sense of self, the, the feminists call it anomi, um, if you're at home. And since women now are getting a taste of the domestic life, you can't tell somebody, when you have somebody that has a steak in front of them versus, you know, a hunk of gristle, you can't tell them that the gristle tastes better than the steak. Uh, same with homeschooling, right? People are tasting homeschooling and they're seeing how it's better than the crappy third rate public education that many of their kids were getting before, which was just glorified daycare. So the, the mother could be out working at her career while being a part time mother in the other half of her life. Um, that's we're tasting kind of a better family life. And we're also seeing that fathers shouldn't be workaholics and that they should, while Fathers do have a duty to provide for their families. They should be providing, and but their providing should be in harmony with their other fatherly roles of showing affective love to their families and teaching their families. So we're seeing some kind of light at the end of the tunnel where we're seeing uh, feminism is being refuted. Some of the lies of feminism are being refuted. Homeschooling is being held up. And public education is being exposed for the fraud that it is. And fathers are getting a taste of what it's like to be uh, not kind of a waspy workaholic, but a true father who is engaged into, into engaged in the home life, engaged in the family life, as true fathers should be. So use this time um, to uh, kind of preach the social gospel of conservatism and Christianity and also, God is using now our hunger and our thirst for the sacraments to purify our love for him. And we're getting a taste of what it's like to be without the sacraments. And I mean, just speaking for myself, I've been a jerk for the last like five weeks, six weeks. And Tim, probably like, you're a jerk every day anyway, so it doesn't matter. But you, we're seeing like exactly, it's almost a scientific experiment. We're seeing like a life of grace juxtaposed against a life of devoid of sacramental graces and it stinks you know so this is god is so good that he can bring good even out of evil and he's using this i think to purify our love for him and to give us a deeper appreciation for the sacramental life which we took for granted i know when confession opens back up everyone's gonna run to get absolution everyone's going to go run and get the Eucharist and maybe start going to daily mass since we've been deprived of mass for so long. I, that's all I got. That's beautiful. I love it. Uh, yeah. So that's a great note to end on. I want to thank the Gordon brothers for coming on. You can take a look at their book. There's a link below. Uh, so I want to thank them for 
coming on. They got their channel as well. Um, next week on Meaning of Cat, they're going to have Chris Plants talking about the ascension and how Christ the King is the essence of the gospel. We're also going to finish that, up. Yeah, you know, you know, you know his soapbox, right? That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's all. It's he's he's all about it. I'm really I'm stoked for that. It's gonna be a great show. Awesome. Uh, he is a monomaniac. Yeah, Captain yeah. Ahab. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. we're also gonna we'll finish up the Catholic social history series, wrapping up Mohammedanism, bringing it to the present. And then we're going to have Matt Gaspers on the show talk about Our Lady of Fatima and the conversion of Mohammedans. Uh, Ramadan is still going on, so please pray for the conversion of Mohammedans. Uh, it's the most pernicious heresy, in my view. And so it's very important that we do address and face the threat and the conversion of souls. Uh, so, and I want to thank everybody, all the patrons, especially what, what the Gordons were saying. Uh, Kennedy has the, his new book, Terror of Demons Reclaiming Traditional Catholic Masculinity. Now is the time for men to arise. We've been laying down for the Marxist feminists for generations. Our fathers, God rest their souls, did this. It's time to arise. It's time to stand up. It's your time right now. Your time, men. You're going to be faced with judgment. You are going to be answering to Jesus Christ, the God and man, at your personal judgment. Think about that right now. Think about your death. Think about what you're going to answer to him when Jesus Christ asks you what you did in this crisis. Be a man of God. Stand up. Arise. Do your duty as a man and fight. So that is my soapbox. box. So let's pray our father. Let's pray on our father for especially for the poor and vulnerable, those who are suffering throughout the world as a result of this crisis, those who have been deprived of their livelihood, uh, they're without food, without a job, they're starving. Let's pray for them, especially if you know any neighbors, anybody in need, anybody you can help out, please remember to help them and give them the support, anything you can, and be mindful of the poor in this in this crisis, especially. So let's pray for the poor. Let's pray against the, the agenda of the communist, whatever, democrat, Chinese party agenda, globalist, whatever is going on. Let's pray against that. And let's offer this all up saying fiat with our lady in the month of may for all that god's will has in store for us whatever suffering may come so let's pray in the name of the father the son the holy ghost amen our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us the day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.